Hey everyone, this lesson is on an introduction to vitamin B1 and vitamin B1 deficiency. So we're going to talk about what vitamin B1 is, we're also going to talk about where we get it, how it's absorbed, what it actually does in our body, and we're also going to talk about some of the causes of vitamin B1 deficiency along with some of the symptoms of vitamin B1 deficiency. So vitamin B1 or thiamine has also been known as enurin, so that was another word for vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 is actually a water-soluble vitamin, and vitamin B1 is actually one of the B vitamins. There's actually seven other ones, so there's eight B vitamins in total. And what's important to recognize about vitamin B1 is that it has a very, very short-term storage, which means that we have to keep replacing it often. So replacement comes in the form of dietary sources. We're going to talk about those dietary sources in a moment. Now, why do we need vitamin B1? We're going to talk about this more in detail in the next slide, but we really need vitamin B1 because it's required for energy metabolism. It acts as a cofactor for proper enzymatic functioning. So it is required for certain enzymes to work properly. And some of those enzymes are involved in carbohydrate metabolism. As I mentioned before, we're going to talk about this more in detail in the next slide. Where do we actually get vitamin B1? So I talked about we get it from dietary sources, but what kind of dietary sources? Well, it's important to note that almost all foods contain at least some vitamin B1, but the foods with the highest amount of vitamin B1 include chicken, pork, soybean, nuts, brown rice, peas, whole grains, and other fortified grains like cereals. So some grains have actually had vitamin B1 added to them, so you get extra vitamin B1 content from those fortified grains. And the recommended daily intake of vitamin B1 or thiamine is actually 1.1 to 1.2 milligrams per day for adults. So generally speaking, it's 1.1 for females, 1.2 for males. And during pregnancy, we need 1.4 milligrams per day. So you need a little higher during pregnancy and we'll see why that is later on. So why do we need thiamine to begin with? There's actually a few enzymes I'm going to talk about here. One of them is transketolase. So transketolase requires thiamine as a cofactor, and it's involved in the pentose phosphate pathway. Another enzyme that's required is pyruvate dehydrogenase, and this enzyme is involved in glycolysis, so breakdown of glucose, so carbohydrate metabolism, very important. And another enzyme that it's required for is alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and this is involved in the Krebs cycle. So essentially gathering NADH and FADH2 from acetyl-CoA, so energy metabolism. So again, transketolase, pyruvate dehydrogenase, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. You don't need to know all of these enzymes. Just recognize that it's important for carbohydrate metabolism, so glucose metabolism, and for energy metabolism in general because of the Krebs cycle. So how is vitamin B1 absorbed and excreted? So I'm going to briefly talk about the absorption and excretion of thiamine. So vitamin B1 or thiamine, when an individual ingests it, it enters into their gastrointestinal tract. And it is a water-soluble vitamin, so it is actually able to be absorbed. And most of the vitamin B1 is absorbed in the jejunum, the second part of the small intestine, by both active and passive processes. When it does get absorbed, it actually enters into the bloodstream and it's not bound to any carrier, can be brought through the aqueous solution of the blood. Eventually, it gets utilized by cells and other processes, but eventually it will lead to the renal system, the kidneys, where it will be excreted in the form of urine. So excretion of vitamin B1, generally speaking, occurs from excretion through the renal system. So again, Vitamin B1 absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract. It's a water-soluble vitamin, so it doesn't require any carrier molecules in the blood to be carried throughout the body. And it's eventually brought to the kidneys and excreted. So now that we know the absorption and excretion of vitamin B1, how do people get deficient in vitamin B1? Well, we talked a lot about the dietary sources. A lot of foods have vitamin B1. So essentially, a poor dietary intake, and when I say poor dietary intake, I mean a very, very poor dietary intake is often required for vitamin B1 deficiency. So we can see this in chronic alcoholism. So individuals with chronic alcoholism oftentimes don't eat a whole lot, and they may also be having an increased loss of vitamin B1 from the renal system. Malnutrition, so 
individuals who don't eat much at all can find themselves deficient in vitamin B1. Excessive fasting and starvation, this ties in with the same concept. Not eating much at all can lead to vitamin B1 deficiency, especially because vitamin B1 only has short-term storage and anorexia nervosa. So individuals who, again, aren't eating enough for the dietary requirement of vitamin B1. A second category of causes of vitamin B1 deficiency include decreased absorption. So where we see decreased absorption oftentimes is in gastrointestinal or GI surgery. So if large portions of the gastrointestinal tract have been removed, this can lead to a decreased ability to absorb vitamin B1. We can also see it in certain chronic gastrointestinal diseases as well. Another category of causes of vitamin B1 deficiency includes increased utilization. So one of them is actually excess carbohydrate ingestion. So individuals who are consuming a high, high level of carbohydrates oftentimes require more vitamin B1 than others because they're using that vitamin B1 as cofactors for those enzymes we talked about to actually metabolize that extra load of carbohydrates. So that's one of the causes of increased utilization. Another one is pregnancy. So in pregnancy, there are increased energy demands. And as we talked about before, this is oftentimes utilized for energy metabolism. So that's why we talked about requiring more vitamin B1 in pregnancy than other non-pregnant individuals. And another cause in the increased utilization category is systemic malignancy. So in systemic malignancy, if there are a lot of cancer burden, these cancer cells can actually start to utilize more and more and more vitamin B1 for their own purposes. So we actually can see a vitamin B1 deficiency in individuals with systemic malignancy. And the fourth category of causes of vitamin B1 deficiency include increased losses. So we talked about that excretion of vitamin B1 from the renal system, from the kidneys, but we can also see it in other ways as well. Hyperemesis, so increased frequency of vomiting can also lead to a vitamin B1 deficiency. Chronic diarrhea can also lead to vitamin B1 deficiency. So essentially you're not able to absorb the vitamin B1. It's leaving the gastrointestinal tract before you're able to absorb it. Increased renal excretion. So even though vitamin B1 is normally excreted in the renal system, taking excess amounts of diuretics can lead to losses of vitamin B1 deficiency. We can also see this with chronic alcoholism as well due to similar reasons. We can also see increased losses with AIDS patients, and we can also see increased losses with hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients. So hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis can actually lead to a loss of vitamin B1. So again, poor dietary intake, so not getting enough in your diet, decreased absorption of that vitamin B1, increased utilization, and increased losses are all causes of vitamin B1 deficiency. So this is not all the causes of vitamin B1 deficiency, but gives you a good framework as to determining what the cause might be. What happens when an individual actually has a vitamin B1 deficiency? So I'm not going to get into all the details with signs and symptoms here. I have other separate lessons on some of these conditions. So please check out those lessons if you want more information. But what I really want to break it down into is two main disease states that are caused by vitamin B1 deficiency. One of those is Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. This condition affects the central nervous system. As we will see, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome is actually more of a clinical spectrum where individuals start with Wernicke syndrome. And oftentimes if the vitamin B1 deficiency is not resolved, will eventually lead into Korsakoff syndrome. Wernicke syndrome is oftentimes an acute reversible condition with signs and symptoms like confusion, ataxia, and nystagmus. I have a whole lesson on this topic. Please check out that lesson if you want more information. With regards to Korsakoff syndrome, if that vitamin B1 deficiency is not corrected, we can get an irreversible condition known as Korsakoff syndrome. In Korsakoff syndrome, we see irreversible memory losses oftentimes, and we also see something called confabulation. Confabulation starts with a C, Korsakoff starts with a K, but I often can remember Korsakoff confabulation. So Korsakoff confabulation, we see individuals with Korsakoff syndrome essentially making up fake memories. They're not lying about the memories. They're not pretending to make them up. They actually think they have these fake memories. So again, check out my lessons on these topics if you want more information. 
And the second main condition I want to talk about here is beriberi. So beriberi often starts with some nonspecific symptoms, can be nausea, can be anorexia, some irritability, maybe some short-term memory changes as well. And then if it's not corrected, it can lead to wet beriberi and dry beriberi. So what are the differences? So wet beriberi, when we say wet, they appear to be wet in the sense that they have edema, so peripheral swelling, so their arms and legs can be swollen, and they can have signs of heart failure and some tachycardia as well. And in the other type of beriberi, known as dry beriberi, we don't see these signs and symptoms of edema and heart failure. We see other symptoms. The peripheral nervous system is affected in dry beriberi. And what we do see is that we see issues with peripheral neuropathy. So nerve pain in the extremities, oftentimes symmetrical. And we also see decreased reflexes. So when we actually test reflexes of these patients, they have decreased reflexes. So I'm not going to get into all the details here. These are their own topics for other lessons. So if you want more information on these topics, please check out my lessons on these conditions. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.